Okay. Um, so we're going to move on to talking about variables. So when we do research, there are different types of variables. We can have experimental variables and control variables. Your experimental variables are the things that you're actually um, changing or measuring, something that's actually involved in the experiment. A control variable is something that you're uh, controlling or holding constant so it doesn't uh, obscure one of your other variables. If we want to look at height and income, you might want to only look at men or only look at women because obviously, you know, there's uh, height differences between men and women. Men are usually taller. And so if you want to look at um, do taller people get paid more or less, you don't want there to be, like, let's say, like a very, a moderately tall woman might be about like an average height man. And so then you might be running out of, uh, you're running into a problem where, like, if it's height uh, that's causing, you know, that taller people get paid more, um, this person might get paid more, but if you're just looking at height, it might look like um, they're getting paid, uh, a shorter person is getting paid more, right? So that would be a control variable. We're only looking at men, or we're only looking at women, something like that. That's a control variable. Then within your experimental variables, you've got two types. You've got an independent variable and a dependent variable. Your independent variable is the thing that you are changing. So in what I've just described to you, uh, do taller people get paid more? There actually is not really an independent variable. There's two dependent variables. There's two things that you're measuring. And that's because that's a correlation. In a correlation, you're not actually doing an experiment. Um, there's nothing that you're doing to show a causal relationship between two things. You've probably heard this before, correlation is not causation. I'm sure that you've at least heard it if you don't understand what it means. But essentially what it means is two things can be correlated. They can be, uh, they can go up. Ice cream can go up. It can be correlated with murder rates. That doesn't mean that one causes the other. There's another variable that's causing both of them. And sometimes there can be two variables that aren't even caused by the same third variable. They just happen to be related. So in a correlation, we don't actually have an independent variable. We're not manipulating anything. But let's say, let's go back to our um, speech therapy A and speech therapy B example. Well, your independent variable is what speech therapy these people get. Do they get the therapy? Do they not get the therapy? And then the dependent variable is uh, how much reduction in, let's say, stuttering do they end up with? Um, do they stutter a lot less? That's your dependent variable. How much they stutter is your dependent variable. Your independent variable is what treatment do they get? Do they get one or do they not get one? Or do they get one? Do they get yours? Do they get the standard one? And do they get nothing? So these are independent and dependent variables. One control variable for your stuttering study might be the age of the people you're working with. So maybe we want to cut out, ah, no, a better one. Here's a better one. We know that you can get, you can begin to stutter with some sort of maybe a trauma, TBI. So let's say that one of our control variables is that we only want to look at people who have developmental stuttering your typical stuttering. We don't want to bring in the people who have stuttering or other disfluency disorders from uh, like an organic cause, something that we can actually identify. Because it could be slightly different. Maybe the treatment doesn't work as well for the organic cause as it does the uh, developmental. So um, that could be your control variable. Okay. Let's move on. Well, so how many variables? Ah, I need to move my head. There we go. How many variables do we want? As few as possible. So like, here's the deal. When you first start doing your own experiment, 
you come up with all this stuff that you want to look at, right? You start thinking about like, oh, this is cool. So this, we want to see um, if this speech therapy is different than this other speech therapy. But we also want to see like, does that, what other demographic factors uh, could play into that, right? So like we want to look at gender, we want to look at socioeconomic status, we want to look at age, we want to look at, um, height, whatever. IQ, that actually might be an interesting one, but we'll, but we'll just lump it in with all the other things that we have. So you have all these variables. Like you start thinking like, oh man, there's so many things that could impact it, right? This is what all people do when they're first starting to do research. There's so many things that could change how this works. And that's true. There are so many things that could change how it works. But measuring too many things obscures the one that you're looking at. So interactions can be interesting. High IQ and these two different types of speech therapies can be interesting. Like, does your IQ impact which therapy is better? Does your gender impact which therapy is better? It might. And it could be cool. It could be really important as well. But for the first study, you want to keep it to as little, diff as little, uh, as few different variables that you're testing as possible. We say that significance is something that's less than 0.05. You might remember this from statistics. Maybe you've seen it in the papers that you use for um, homework two. But a P of 0.05 or less is considered significant. That means there's an important difference between the two groups. You have to raise that benchmark. Or rather, you have to lower it, sorry. You have to lower that benchmark for each additional thing that you're testing. And that's because it's like probability. So if you have, you know, one uh, dice that you're rolling, like a regular six-sided I don't even know why I'm looking around. There's no way that I have dice in here. Anyway, so you roll one six-sided die, and what's the probability that you're going to get a six? Well, one out of six. Um, but then let's say you want to look at a second variable, so you take a second die and you roll that, and you're like, what's the probability that we're going to get a six? Well, now it's greater because you have two chances to get a six right and you're doing them independently you're throwing these two things independently so um, now it's like a two-sixth chance that you're going to get one six if you throw a third one or a fourth one soon it becomes very likely that you're going to get one accidentally like what we're looking for is that this therapy reduces something more than this one um, and there's always slop right there's always noise like you can get somebody who really responds to any therapy that ended up in your group and so any therapy is going to help them so they go from like having a lot of stuttering to hardly any uh, and they just happen to be in that group or you can get somebody that's really resistant to any kind of therapy they just happen to be over here the more things you test the more it's going to look like that group had a significant difference but maybe they didn't. So what you want to do is keep it as simple as possible. Does, is this different than this? Yes. And then from there, once you've already shown this difference, then you can start looking at some of the other factors. But before that, you have to keep it small. The other thing is the more things you throw in, you're going to have an interaction between them all. So if we say that there's an interaction between the uh, therapy type and age and gender and IQ, how, what does that even mean? Like, if you are, if you have a, a boy that's seven and a high IQ, they need to get this therapy. But if you have a girl that's three and a low IQ it's the, well it wouldn't even be that because that's not exactly an interaction so it's like it'd be like a girl that's three with high IQ gets this one a boy that's three with low IQ gets this one a boy that's seven with high IQ then goes back to the first one and a girl that's seven with a low IQ then gets the 
you see, it's hard to even conceptualize what a five-way interaction could mean. And how do you visualize it? And how do you put that into practice? It doesn't really make sense. You need to create some sort of flow chart. So if you really want people to use what you've found and to put it in practice that in a way that's better for most people, uh, you have to keep it simple. Okay. Oh, wait. Oh, it's not going forward. There we go. Um, okay, so when you talk about levels of a variable, that's easy. That just means, like, how many different things are there, right? How many instances of one variable can there be? Let's talk about a drug. Um, let's talk about some sort of cholesterol-reducing drug. I know that's not really a speech therapy thing, but, pff, you know, whatever. Um, if we do 0 milligrams and 10 milligrams of Lipitor, like, let's say we want to test out, like, does Lipitor work? We can do zero milligrams, which is essentially not taking Lipitor, and we can do 10 milligrams. That's two levels. It's one variable. The variable is Lipitor, uh, and there's two levels. What if we want to test more than that, though? So let's say that we have zero milligrams, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, and 30 milligrams. We want to see, like, is there a difference in not taking it and taking it, does your cholesterol, is your cholesterol reduced from not taking it to taking it? And do you get a better reduction with more of the drug or do you kind of plateau after a while? So does it even matter if we give somebody 30 if they're getting already a good enough response at 10? This means that there's four levels. There's still only one independent variable, which is Lipitor. But there's four levels of that variable, 0, 10, 20, and 30 milligrams. Um, it's best to try to keep these in some sort of order. And that's just when you make a graph, it looks prettier. It's easier to understand, right? So if you keep it like 10, 20, 30, it makes more sense. Sometimes things don't really make sense. So like if we're testing something where um, we're having people make sense of a, an object and they can either um, touch it and they're always going to touch it and, and that's it. So maybe they just, they're blindfolded and they have earplugs in and they can just touch this object. That's zero. And then they can touch it and they can see that's one. They can touch it and they can only hear that's two say, and then they can see and hear and touch it. And that's, the next one you just you kind of make it somewhat like in a numerical order or chronological type thing but sometimes you have to get creative with how that works okay uh, one of those like I'm saying to put that into perspective you're testing out no speech therapy the typical speech therapy and your speech therapy so you'd go zero and then one one so you just kind of decide like who whichever one goes where if you think yours is better then you'd go zero traditional yours and what you'd hope you'd see is like three bars where um, zero has a lot of stuttering the traditional has a moderate amount and yours has very little and so then you can in your mind draw a nice little line where you show like look the traditional therapy works and mine is even better. All right. Ah, uh, yeah, this is cool too. So, um, where do we go after this? Okay, we'll finish off with this. Um, oh no, I'm looking at the time the wrong way. We just did only 13. Don't mind me, I'm crazy. So, science is like a cycle. And this is going to be true for... Uh, your clinical work as well. The only difference with the cycle is that in research, the cycle never ends. Um, but in clinical work, your goal is to have someone be better. And then they don't need to come and work with you anymore. They're not your client anymore. And that's a great time. But there still is a cycle. So in science and doing research, we start with our research question, a falsifiable research question. It's also a focused question, 
that identifies what the IVs and DVs are, the independent and dependent variables are. Um, and then also, you know, really you should have uh, like a literature review, which you guys did in uh, homework two. You read other papers and put it together, like here's the background information on this disorder, and then you're left with a hypothesis. So you're kind of set up to start a research study. You'd need to do a little bit more of a literature search if you were actually going to do one, but you know, you're on the way. Then what you do is you set up your study, you collect your data. So you, you set up your study where you have your um, stuttering therapy and you have the other stuttering therapy, whatever the you know current standard is when you're doing this. You're going to give both of these. You're going to give people a test before to see how much they're stuttering before they take either therapy. You have them run through the therapy, you test them at the end. That's data collection. Then you're going to analyze the results. Is there a difference between these two um, therapies? And then you go back to the top. If there was no difference, but you really think there was, maybe try to identify a problem in the study. Or let's say you've done that a couple times and there's just no difference. Well, now it's time to move on to something else. Maybe you can come up with a different method that can help reduce stuttering. So you scrap the old one because it wasn't working, it wasn't reducing it more than the other, and you start on a new one. So it's always a cycle. Science never ends. Which in a way, when I say this, is kind of like causing an existential problem because it's like I've gone into an area of work where there will still be science left undone no matter how much I do when I die. So I can't ever accomplish anything. Oh well. Um, at least if you go into clinical work, uh, you will have people who, you know, do well enough that you can, um, they can transition out of therapy and, uh, and go on. And that, that's not a satisfaction I'll ever get. Um, okay, so when we talk about research designs, there's a couple different things that we want to talk about. We're not going to go super deep into this. Um, if you have one person only, like let's say a lot of the aphasia studies, which remember we know that aphasia um, and other TBI, like we can group them together, but there are some strange differences. Each person with a, a TBI or a, you know some sort of stroke or um, any other neurogenic uh, problem, they're unique. Same with people with um, with ASD although we don't usually do case studies on them, but um, so we'll stick with TBI. But people with TBI in slightly different areas can have completely different um, responses. There's one that I can think of in particular. There's two, actually. Uh, one was a woman who um, had a stroke, and she was totally fine, except that she didn't, music didn't elicit emotion in her anymore. So she used to be able to listen to things and she'd be like, oh, it's calming or, oh, it's scary or whatever. And she has the stroke gone. Now she listens to this music and it doesn't cause anything. Um, you know that, <laughs> like in, in cartoons and stuff, there's like this flute song that they always play like when a day is, is dawning. And that doesn't make her think of, like, a new dawning day. Which it does to us because we've seen it a million times, but it doesn't work for her. And uh, you can have, like, little tense violins and there's somebody creeping up behind somebody and the music doesn't do anything for her. Um, so then she's less freaked out by this tense scene in a horror movie uh, than the rest of us. Uh, and so this is a case study. There's really only one person who has a, uh, a lesion in this precise part of the temporal lobe that causes this problem. Um, so that's a case study. There's another one. There's a guy called HM. Uh, if you're interested in this, I will email me and I'll tell you more. This dude is like, it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing case. He lost all memory. I mean, like, not even, like, 51st dates where they, like, lost everything, but then they can keep track of a day. 
This guy couldn't even keep track of a day. Uh, like, if it left his short-term memory by about, I want to say, 10 minutes or so, it's gone. Like, he has no memory beyond what he did the last couple minutes ago. So, they would, like, take him around and... Um, They'd take him to his favorite hamburger place. What was his favorite hamburger place before he had... His was actually a surgery, not a stroke, but anyway. And uh, they'd be like, here's a hamburger. And he's like, yeah, nice. And they leave, and they're like, are you hungry? And he's like, I mean, I guess so. And they're like, this used to be your favorite burger place. So they take him in, they get him a burger again, and he's like, nice. And then they leave, and they say, hey, are you hungry? And I think he had three burgers, and then they tried it again, and he's like, I really don't feel like eating for some reason like nothing sounds good to me and so they kind of you know figured out the the extent of this um another thing that's really interesting about that is he had no memory for uh like what he had done but he had good motor memory so they would put this little like uh squeaky thing not it's not, like not a squeaky thing but like an alarm is what i'm trying to think of like um, it just is like a little noisemaker and it chirps and they hide it under the carpet in a room and they like put him in this room and they're like find the the alarm thing and he got a huge kick out of it he thought it was amazing it was like a cool scavenger hunt and the first time he did it it took him a long time to try to, fi to figure out where it was and over time he got progressively better um like one of the last times they did this, they hid it under the carpet in a in. It's always hidden in the same place. It doesn't matter if they move it for this guy because he doesn't remember where it is. Um, so they put it in this place under that's in the same place under the carpet that it's been the whole time. He gets just as much of a kick out of it. He's like, "Wow, that's so amazing! This can be hidden under the carpet. My mind is blown." And he walks right to it, and he's like, "It's here." And they're like, how did you do that? And he's like, I don't know. Just So he had no conscious memory of anything, but somehow developed motor memory. Anyway, that's a unique thing. That's a case study. Um, and all you can really do with that is describe, like I just did to you, how weird these things are. But you really can't compare anything. When you have between two and about 20, you have to do something called small end designs. Those are also uh, suboptimal, um, but they can be done. Um, so that's a different category of experiment designs that you have to look into. And then when you get to 30 or more, you can do traditional experimental designs, 30 participants or more in each group. Why is it 30? This is not going to be on the exam. Why is it 30? 30 might be. Remember that it's like you need 30 to do traditional experimental design. The reason why it's 30 is because at this point, this is when you can take a group and their standard error starts to look like the population. It just, I don't know, if, you, if it's been a while since statistics, that's like, you just said words that mean nothing to me. You could have said like three different varieties of Italian tomato and I wouldn't have, right? So all it means is you can make a lot of inferences from this size of a group of 30 or more to what the population is like. And the amount of explanatory power you get as you go up from 30 diminishes. So if you go from 30 to 100, um, your explanatory power increases a bit. But if you go from 100 to 200, you don't nearly get as much of an explanatory jump. So you're getting diminishing returns. Um, typically, on, depending on the study, you want somewhere between 30 and 100 people per group. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's good enough. It, it gives you a really good idea. If there's something that you're gonna detect, you're probably gonna detect it. If you need 100,000 people to detect an effect, that's not a good effect. It's a very small effect. So um, anyway, I know I spouted a bunch of gobbledygook at you, but but basically, when you have 30 or more, it starts to look like how the population looks. I figured this out through math and statistics. It doesn't really matter, but that's what you need to take home is 30, 30 plus per group 
That's where you want to be. And that's a good traditional research design. Oh, here's a picture of it. You can see that this is with an N of 15. This is with an N of 135. So they've jumped up 120 participants between the green line and the red line. And then from the green line to the blue line, they've jumped up uh, almost 400, 365 participants, which is like three times the number of participants that they jumped from the green to blue. So they've got three times the participants between red and blue as they do between green and red, yet the difference between those lines is getting incrementally smaller. So that's showing you that you're not getting much more as you uh, bump up your participants. And you can also imagine that the more participants you have, the more time it is for you to do this. Imagine having to do different therapies on 500 people per group. That's a thousand people if you have two groups. But if you have 30 per group, well, it's 60 if you have two groups, it's 90 if you have three. That's like definitely manageable, especially if you have one or two other people that you're working with. But 500? ridiculous so it's more manageable it's better we can actually do manageable science and publish things before we're like a hundred years old um, if we follow these rules of 30 plus between 30 and 100 usually okay uh, this will probably be my last slide um, of this portion then we'll move on um, what I, oh, my head's in the wrong place again. I think I'm going to have to move my head over on top of this barley, which is kind of a bummer. Barley is amazing. Anyway, so I really want to quickly talk about probability and distributions. Um, this, I think, is amazing. Um, it's kind of like the crux of science. Like, it's hard to do science. It's hard to compare groups and, and learn anything if we're not sure about probability and distributions and how to test these things. Um, so it all comes down to music and beer. The whole, all of modern science is music and beer. Done. And I will tell you that it doesn't really matter uh, what your background is. Um, there's people of all sorts of different uh, you know, walks of life have made really amazing contributions to modern science and probability and distribution in the name of music and beer. So we've got three. This is Alkindi right here. Uh, this is William Seeley Gossett. Well, it's a plaque with his name on it. And then this is Stella Cunliffe. And I'll tell you very quickly about them. So Alkindi, uh, he's this like BC dude, right? Like Ottoman Empire, like way back. Well, actually, it wasn't BC times. It was like during the Middle Ages when the all of Europe kind of descended into chaos and nobody did any science or anything, and they were just like, "Whoa, dragons!" and there and there weren't any. They just thought there were for probably because they didn't do science. Um, the Ottoman Empire were doing like all sorts of cool science, particularly Al Kindi. That was actually a couple of really cool. Ottoman scientists. I'm not going to go into it. I'm just focused on this one guy. Anyway, um, he was like walking around and he's like talking to somebody and they're like, how many bricks do you think were used to construct this fortress that we're looking at? And he's like, you know, that's a good question. I wonder if we can estimate the number of bricks that were used in the construction of this uh, without counting them all. So what they did was they kind of like randomly sampled different little areas of the fortress. And they're like, count the number in this, count the number in this little area, count the number in this little area. And now we have this idea of how many bricks, the average number of bricks that are in areas of the size. And then we can multiply that average number by the size of the fort walls. So they did and they came up with a number. And then he had all these like little um, dudes, like, you know, servants and stuff. And he's like, okay, go count all the bricks. And so they, they like ran off and they counted all the bricks. And they came back and they're like, whoa, dude, you were off by like half a brick. 
and uh, he's like, cool, I'm going to write a paper on this and uh, sing songs about it. He was, I should have mentioned this, in addition to being a mathematician, he was a songwriter, a poet, he was like an adventurer, kind of, like he liked to travel around, um, a mathematician, um, but mostly he just like played songs and people thought he was like this cool dude, and then he had people run off and count bricks in a wall for him but it was it's the first recorded uh instance of somebody using measures of central tendency of an average to um be able to figure out the whole picture of something not necessarily the first ever but the first recorded um so pretty amazing then we move to this dude William Seeley Gossett. He was, if you've ever heard of, so you've probably heard of a t-test. If you've heard it called student's t-test, uh, it doesn't mean that it's for students. It actually, um, this guy, William Seeley Gossett, called himself student in these letters that he wrote when he was coming up with, basically, the t-test. Why did he come up with the t-test? Well, he wanted to know which type of grain produced yielded which type of plant yielded more barley uh, because he was the chief brewer at guinness in ireland so he wanted to be able to tell his growers like get this plant because we get a lot more out of it and we're going to make more beer if you have a better plant so he could measure how much you know barley each plant gave but of course, it, it varies wildly from plant to plant. If you grow anything uh, in your own garden or a window box or something, you know uh, how true that is. You can have one bell pepper plant that grows like 30, and you have one that grows one. It's the same type of bell pepper plant. So what's the average number of bell peppers from a plant? Well, you can find that out. You can find out the average. But then, is that a meaningful difference between those two averages? This dude, William Seeley Gossett, came up with the way to figure out if it's a meaningful uh, difference between those two averages. So he counted up one type of uh, the yield from one type of barley, the yield from a second type of barley, and then could say, you know, statistically, barley A produces more uh, yield for us to make more beer. So let's grow that. And then lastly, we have this, uh, this lady, Stella Cunliffe, here who also worked at Guinness and following in the tradition of William Seeley Gossett did something amazing. She finally took these uh, statistical proportional distribution probabilistic things and put it into human terms. What was going on was uh, too many bad batches of Guinness were going out to pubs. And people were getting really unhappy with this. As you can imagine, you don't want a bad batch of Guinness. Like, you paid $5 for this. I don't want to drink a crappy glass of beer or a flat or whatever. So um, a lot of brewers were returning their, um, their kegs. They weren't, at this point, I think they were still in, in wood, but probably you call it a keg. <clears throat> anyway, they're returning their kegs, and they're pretty unhappy with Guinness at this point. And she's like, we got to figure out what's going on. So she came up with this. Uh, I'm not sure if she came up with it, but she put it into practice. Um, something called D prime. It doesn't. You don't need to know what D prime is. Basically, it just shows um, how different you think two groups might be. And one group might be good beer, and one group might be bad beer. And, of course, good beer doesn't have one definition. There's a range of good beer. Like, this one is a little weird, but it's pretty good. And this one is the best beer I've ever had. And you can have bad beer that's, like, absolutely terrible. Or it's okay, but I'd rather not, right? So it's a range. There's a distribution to it. And what she did was she put into practice this method that they could see how far apart these distributions were. And what she noticed was, actually, her taste testers could tell pretty consistently what was good beer and what was bad beer. But their line of decision was much heavily weighted 
uh, to saying that things were good. So they were produ they were um, sending out all the good beer, but because the distribution slightly overlap, if you think of my thumbs as the tails of those distributions, they slightly overlap. This is this right here is good beer, and there's a little bit of good beer right here, but there's also bad beer that's overlapping it. They're sending out all of the good beer. But that means they're also sending out quite a bit of bad beer. And she tried to figure out why. And what she figured out was, if the beer was good, they kicked the barrel down a hill and it would go into a cart, which then a horse grabbed the cart and took it out to the pubs. If the beer was bad, they had to roll it up a hill to the garbage pile. So what she did was she <laughs> had them change the way the factory layout was so that uh, you kicked it down a hill both ways. The garbage pile was now downhill, and also the cart to send it out to the breweries was downhill. And the, the ability to tell which beer was good and bad didn't change, but the decision line for what they were going to keep changed just by on the basis of being so easy to either kick the beer downhill or have to push it up by making it a kick either way uh, they started sending out a lot more a lot less bad beer um, and people were more happy with uh, the beer that was being produced so you know it's all like i said it's all beer and music but it has nothing to do with um the the people like any anybody any of you uh, could put anything like this into practice or come up with a new um, statistical test a new uh, area of research find something really interesting it's not you know anybody can do it um, so and it doesn't have to be in music and beer it's just more fun if it's in music and beer so anyway this is where we're going to end this section there's going to be uh, one more